Okay, so uh, let's uh, start again. So after uh, Francesco lectures, I think uh, gave a very nice overview of how we actually calculate um, vibrational properties of solids based on the Born-Oppenheimer uh, energy surface, the standard approximation, which is the harmonic approximation, and he gave some fingerprints of the problems that this uh, approximation might have, in which system this is uh, really uh, collapsing, and what I'm going to talk about right now is actually I'm going to present the stochastic cell consistent harmonic approximation method, which is the method that we use to really overcome all these uh, difficulties and, and calculate vibrational properties of solids in these kind of situations, right? So does this work? Yeah. So basically, first of all, I'm going to talk a bit about the perturbative regime of unharmonicity, right? Then I'll go to the non-perturbative regime of anharmonicity. Then I will present in depth the uh, stochastic cell consistent harmonic approximation. Okay? So we have two regimes of uh, anharmonicity. Okay? One is the, uh, basically I'm going to use this notation. So this is going to be the Born-Oppenheimer energy surface that was introduced by Francesco in the previous lecture. To me this R, without any index, will be the coordinates of all the ions in the crystal. Okay? So it's, if you want this R, are all the ions in the crystal, okay? So this is the Taylor expansion that uh, Francesco introduced. So here we have the calculation of the Born-Oppenheimer term at the, let's say, the ionic positions that minimize the Born-Oppenheimer positions, okay? Which are, in the harmonic approximation, the equilibrium positions, okay? So that's why there is no first-order term in the expansion, as Francesco explained. So the first non-trivial term is the harmonic term. I'm going to call it V2, okay? And then we're going to have all the higher order terms, okay? Which are the unharmonic terms of the boron Heimer potential, right? So this Taylor expansion is completely valid, right? Because it defines if the expansion is infinite, the, the full potential can be exactly uh, uh, described at any, uh, if we go to infinite number of orders, obviously. Because you can do a Taylor expansion at any point, right? right? So this is correct, okay? It, it describes the full potential. So when unharmonicity is perturbative, right? It is perturbative when the higher order terms are small compared to the harmonic term. But in which range? This is important, okay? In the range, right? So this would be this case, right? In the range defined by the zero point energy, okay? Of the ionic motion. What is the zero point energy? Imagine that we have this potential, we know how to solve the Schrodinger equation that Francesco introduced, the quantum mechanical Schrodinger equation for the uh, ionic motion, basically the kinetic energy of the ions plus this full potential, and we calculate the ground state energy. That's the zero point energy, okay? In the harmonic approximation, if the system is purely harmonic, it's one half h bar of omega, okay? This is the zero point energy, right? So this is the scale that defines when we are in the perturbative regime or not, okay? So therefore, if in this energy, Right, defined by the zero point energy, these higher order terms are small compared to the harmonic, we would be in the perturbative regime. Right? In this order, for example, we are in the non perturbative regime. When in this energy range, the higher order terms of the potential are, they are of the same order or even larger than the harmonic term. Right? And this, for example, in this kind of case, if I do the Taylor expansion here, right, the second uh, uh, harmonic term defines a negative curvature, right? So therefore, this means that in this range defined by the zero-point energy, these higher order terms are what really determine the potential, right? Not the second order term, right? So in this case, forget about doing any kind of perturbative uh, approach to solve the vibrational properties. Here, we cannot do anything based on the harmonic approximation, right? We need to go beyond. So let me just give you uh, some small tips of what is perturbation theory and how we deal with it, okay? Maybe these are a bit technical, but I think this is going to be good to introduce a bit uh, lecture four. I think it's lecture four that is going to be given by Rafael Obiaco, right? So uh, the effect of unharmonicity and any other interaction, okay, uh, should be included in a, in, in a perturbative approach using many-body perturbation theory, right? So which basically, it, it means Green's functions and, uh, and Feynman diagrams and self-energies. Okay, this is what it means. So basically the Green function, which is the basics to study the, the, the nuclear 
uh, the, the ionic uh, displacements, is this green function, which is the correlation function between the displacements, this is u and b, of the, of, the, of the ions, right? So to me, A and B will, uh, will be indexes that will determine both an atom and a Cartesian index. So it's a combined index, right? So it's, it, this way we simplify a bit the notation, okay? So A is an atom and a Cartesian index, okay? So this is a complex time, and this is the time order operator, and here we have the mass, okay? And this defines this uh, green function, okay? So in principle, everything, uh, if we know this green function with all the interactions and everything, we should know everything about the ionic fluctuations, everything of the system. We should be able to calculate all the spectral properties uh, measured in experiments and so on. Okay, so this is the goal, right? So here, the here we have the quantum statistical average taken with a density matrix, okay, which is defined by the full Hamiltonian of the system. Okay, let's say the ionic term plus the full Born-Oppenheimer interaction. Okay, in principle here, there is no approximation. This is the exact uh, green function, okay, or, or, or if you want, displacement, displacement correlation function of the, of the system, right? So then the interactions enter in the self-energy, phi, okay, and what we are supposed to solve is this Dyson equation, okay? So here we have the interacting green function, the full green function, okay? Here we have the non-interacting green function, okay, which will be in perturbation theory will, will, will be the harmonic green function, okay? Okay, and then we have here this term, which is uh, G0, the self-energy, and the interacting one. So basically, in terms of a uh, green function, we have this the Dyson, Dyson equation, we have it in this way, okay? Where here, this self-energy defines the full interaction, okay? Here, this H0, which is the one that defines the, 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 the non-interacting green function, is the har uh, harmonic solution, so which we will be basically taking this expectation value with the density matrix defined by the harmonic solution. Okay, so this would be the many-body picture. Okay. So when we do perturbation theory on an harmonicity, this is what we are supposed to do, and maybe this. Uh, so we have at lowest order of perturbation theory, we build from the harmonic solution. Okay, calculating our uh, Taylor expansion at the positions that minimize the born oppenheimer uh, uh, potential, right? And we should calculate these three Feynman uh, self-energy diagrams. This is called the tadpole, this is called the loop, and this is called the bubble, okay? So as you can see here, we have here, these are phonon legs, if you want, in terms of uh, many-body theory. This has two third-order vertices, okay? This, the loop one, has a fourth order vertex. So let's say this means that there are four legs that enter into the vertex, right? And here we have two uh, third order vertices, okay? So this is the harmonic theory. And we know the expression, so this you can go to, for example, uh, the Maham book, or also uh, Cowley wrote uh, in the 60s several books where this is well described, right? So these are the energies, uh, the self-energy terms, where here we have uh, the tadpole basically has no uh, frequency dependence, right? It has here, you have here the harmonic phonon frequencies it are gonna be this omega. Here we have the boson einstein occupation factor, and here you can see we have two third order vertices, okay? Which are this one and this one, okay? This is the loop, here we have uh, harmonic phonon frequency, we have the fourth order vertex, which is this one, and here we have the, the Boson, Boson Einstein occupation factor, and so on. And this is the bubble, which depends on, 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 on the frequency, okay? Which is given by this uh, equation. So we have this vertex squared, basically this and these are basically the same, and we have here this function. So I, I give this function explicitly here. The vertices are basically this object, so it's written in, in a normal mode basis here, mu1 and so on are mode indexes. Here we have the uh, force constant, okay, which are the Fourier transform of the nth order derivative of the born oppenheimer potential with respect to the ionic positions taken at the uh, position that minimizes the, the, the born oppenheimer potential, right? Here we have polarization vectors, okay, which are those that diagonalize this equation that Francesco introduced in his previous lecture. Here we have the second order force constant, Okay, second so derivatives of the born oppenheimer potential calculated at the equilibrium position, divided by the square root of the masses. These are the polarization vectors, and here we have our harmonic quantum frequencies. Okay. 
and this f function that uh, it, it enters in the in the in the bubble uh, uh, self energy diagram is given by these where you have just frequencies and Bose Einstein optimization factors. Okay. So this is uh, the way. So to, to go to calculate perturbation theory exactly at the perturbative order. Okay. And in principle, with that, you can do whatever you want, right? So you can calculate the spectral functions, for example. So the spectral function that uh, is proportional to the to the signal in Raman, infrared, uh, in elastic X-ray, all the experiments that Francesco introduced in the previous lecture will be proportional to this spectral function, which can be calculated from the imaginary part of our green function, okay? That, that we calculate in that way. So this, in terms, in, in practice, this will give us a spectra that looks more realistic. So in the purely harmonic approximation, the spectral function is just a Dirac delta centered at the harmonic value, right? But when we do this kind of stuff, okay, then there is a shift from the harmonic frequency, okay, this shift, let's say, this is related to the real part of the self energy, okay? And the, the broadening of the, of, the, of the phonon peak is related to the imaginary part of the self energy, okay? So this is perturbation theory, and this is how you are supposed to apply it, but, okay, uh, the problem is that this is just valid when the self energy, okay, is small compared to the harmonic phonon frequencies, right? So when the self energy is just a small correction to the harmonic solution. So this is when the perturbative approach is valid, right? So still, this is not so trivial, doing perturbation theory on an harmonicity. Why? Because we need to calculate the higher order force constants, which are derivatives of the bohr oppenheimer potential with respect to displacements. So imagine if you have, you have a crystal, so the degrees of freedom are crazy, so calculating these derivatives are, it's very, it's very difficult, right? So there are different ways of doing it. For example, uh, you can do it with density functional perturbation theory using the 2n plus 1 theorem, and this can give you the third order uh, force constant right away. So the Lorenzo Paolato work and, and Francesco worked on that. And actually, I think this is implemented in quantum express already, for example. The quantum express code can calculate in this way third order force constant. Okay. You can always do finite difference approaches. So let's say you just uh, displace atoms and uh, calculate derivatives and so on. But if you want to approach all these uh, force constant, this is terribly tedious. So it's very complicated, right? So especially if you want to do it ab initio. So it's terribly expensive because you need to map big supercells and calculating these derivatives is very heavy. It's very, it's a mess, okay? So for example, this is the approach that I did uh, in my thesis back a uh, long time ago. Uh, you can, if you want to do it faster, you can go to empirical potentials and you can, okay, solve these things with uh, finite differences but empirical potentials, which are cheaper because you don't need to map the born oppenheimer potential with, uh, with EFT. But obviously, they have all the limitations of empirical potentials. They may not be so accurate. Okay. You can do things that are a bit more intelligent. So basically, uh, try to see which are the most important terms in this uh, force constant, because maybe not all are important. Maybe with some of them, you can already get the physics. And this is the compressive sensing techniques that can maybe, I think, are a good way if you really want to make a Taylor expansion and get these terms. And they will tell you which are the best things. But this is the perturbative approach. I mean, and, and the Sha method is a non-perturbative approach, right? And yes, I want to illustrate this with an example of why we really need this quantum uh, uh, and harmonic non-perturbative result. So imagine we have our Born-Oppenheimer potential is something like that, okay? This is the potential. So what would be the classical solution? The classical solution we tell us, okay, our positions are the minimum of the, of the potential, right? And then we would calculate here a second derivative, right? the harmonic force constants, and we would diagonalize, and this will give us a frequency, so there will, uh, the system will oscillate right here. This is the classical harmonic solution, okay? Okay, it, I know it's confusing the, the term classical here, because if we, we can solve this harmonic problem, as Francesco explained, with quantum mechanics, if we go to creation, annihilation operators, and so on, but it's classical in the sense that the ions are at the classical position, okay? As if they were a ball, and they vibrate around that position. Okay, but we know that the system is a, it's quantum. Ions are quantum objects. So in principle, we should solve the Schrodinger equation with a full potential, right? Imagine that that solution gives us this wave function, right? 
So what is the position? Now, what is the equilibrium reference position? Right? So if we want to solve that question, we need to calculate the uh, expectation value with this weight function of the position of the reactor. That's what we are supposed to do in quantum mechanics. Right? And it can happen that this position is right here, for example. Right? So let's say our quantum position is this one. It's very different for, from the classical solution in this example. Right? So imagine now that we want to do uh, calculate for that position the second derivative and do a Taylor expansion and truncate at second order, right? What happens? The second derivative here, okay, maybe this is not very good, right? But it's concave, okay? So it's concave. It's not convex like here, because if we are in the minimum, it has to be convex the second derivative. But here, no. So this means that the 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 the, the harmonic solution has no ground state. So we cannot do any perturbative approach if we want to describe this solution. There is no way we can do perturbation theory because the, ground, the harmonic solution is not defined. It has imaginary formants, if you want, or negative, as they were appearing in Francesco's talk, right? And that this is because here the, the, the potential is, is uh, it's concave, right? Okay? So this can happen, and there are many situations where this is the situation. Okay? So forget about doing any perturbative approach in this case. So uh, Francesco went through this. That this non-perturbative approach is very important in many cases, right? So Francesco said that. So in compounds with light atoms, this can happen. In hydrogen storage materials, hydrogen-based superconductors, hydrogen at high pressures. Not always, but in many cases, this happens, right? In uh, systems with, uh, that they are very close to second order, displacive structural transitions, charge and situation, ferroelectrics, thermoelectrics, multiferroics, et cetera, et cetera also systems that are close to melting at very high temperature. So we can enter into this regime, right? How, uh, ways to calculate that. So the typical standard way of approaching the non-perturbative regime is molecular dynamics, okay? And if you are doing calculating molecular dynamics with uh, ab initio methods, right? So you are doing ab initio molecular dynamics. What are these? These are, we are applying Newtonian mechanics to the ions. Let, let, let's say they move with Newton's mechanics, right? With DFT forces, the forces calculated with DFT, right? Then you can extract the phonon frequencies, like from velocity autocorrelation functions. You can do another method, which is uh, the te temperature-dependent effective potential. I think it's the name, right? So you can extract, uh, uh, basically fitting the, the molecular dynamics trajectory, the the, the uh, an effective harmonic potential and third order potential, right? The problem of, of using a molecular dynamics is that it's based on Newtonian mechanics. So basically, if you go to t equals zero, in molecular dynamics, the atoms do not move, okay? So if you go to t equals zero in molecular dynamics, the atoms are steady in their, in their classical position. And this is not physical. They, they need to move. They need to fluctuate also at t equals zero, right? This is the zero point motion. Okay, so a way of overcoming that is to go to path integral molecular dynamics where you integrate, you use quantum dynamics with VFT forces. So this is a, a very, uh, I think this is the, the benchmark method, right? So when you are doing with uh, non-perturbative and harmonicity, this is the, 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 the best method you can, you can come up with, right? But it's very expensive if you are doing uh, ab initio. It's very expensive. So another solution to approach the, 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 the non-perturbative regime is to do variational methods, right? So a variational method, one is the variational self-consistent field equations, okay? That somehow this is an old idea that uh, more recently uh, was used by, by Montserrat and so on. Or you can do this, uh, use the self-consistent harmonic approximation, okay? Which is, uh, the idea is to minimize the free energy of the system with a trial harmonic density matrix. And this idea is not, doesn't belong to us. This, is, this was proposed in the 50s by Hutton, okay? And in the 60s and the 70s, it was implemented as well with empirical potentials and so on, right? Somehow what we have done is to do a stochastic implementation of this theory so that it's useful to, uh, to, to, to combine it with modern ab initio uh, methods. And also it's true that we have gone a bit beyond in the theory because we have expanded this theory uh, to, uh, to, to also to time-dependent phenomena, where therefore we can talk about spectral functions and so on. So this will be, I think, explained in lecture four. Okay. 
So today, uh, my goal is to present uh, the stochastic uh, self consistent harmonic approximation, or how we do these things, what it is based on, and so on. I hope you can uh, uh, understand. So please, if you have questions along the way, please just raise your hand, okay? So maybe in this way we do it more, uh, uh, we interact more, okay? Because maybe then you forget about your question. So interrupt me if you want, okay, at any moment. So this is the idea. So this is the Shah method. Uh, I think the best paper to read is this one. So if you want to read a paper about it, it's this one. So it's the 2021. Okay? Because if you read the history, I mean, I mean we learned along the way. So somehow the original uh, paper of 2014 uh, maybe has some misconceptions that somehow appear, uh, clar will clarify later. So I recommend if you want to read about that, read this paper, not the, not the old ones. Okay? So the idea is that we want to obtain uh, the best harmonic density matrix that minimizes the total energy without approximating the born oppenheimer potential. So this is the idea of the Shah. So this is the free energy of, uh, of our system. This is the kinetic energy of the ions. And this is the full born oppenheimer potential, right? So, so the quantum statistical average taken with the density matrix is the energy. And here we have the entropy term, okay? So which is the quantum uh, statistical average of the logarithm of the, of the distribution, so the density matrix, okay? So this is our free energy. So we want to obtain the best uh, harmonic density matrix that gives us the minimum of this free energy. This is the idea. It's just that, okay? So in, uh, I, I'm saying that's why it's called self-consistent harmonic, okay? The, the, the self-consistent harmonic comes because we are using a harmonic density matrix, okay? And as it is a harmonic density matrix, so the probability distribution function that it defines, so which is basically, if you want, uh, the probability that we have to find an ion in a given position of space, right, is parameterized by two types of parameters, okay? Uh, this kind of fancy R, calligraphic R, these are the centroid positions, okay? Somehow, where is the center of our ionic wave function? And therefore, then we have some kind of auxiliary second order force constant, this, okay, that in the end they tell us where or, or what's the width of this wave function around the centroid position. That's all they tell us, okay? If you want, this theory is like the Hartree Fock, but for the phonons, okay? So these are slides of Hartree Fock. What do we do in Hartree Fock? We describe the electronic wave function, okay? as a Slater determinant based on single particle, if you want, single particle orbitals, right? And then we calculate the energy with this wave function the, with the kinetic energy of the electrons plus the full Coulomb interaction without approximating the Coulomb interaction, this is the key, right? And we minimize this object with respect to the orbitals here, we have here. That's hartree fock Here we do the same in the sense that we have a single particle picture for the phonons, which is the harmonic one, as Francesco said, in the harmonic picture, all phonons are independent. So we can uh, somehow, it's, we have a single particle picture for the phonons, like in the hartree fock approach. We calculate the energy, in this case the free energy, without approximating the born oppenheimer potential and optimize our uh, single particle wave functions, if you want, the harmonic density matrix. This is the idea, right? So let's be a bit more specific. So imagine we, wa uh, we want to calculate the, the free energy of our system. So what is our Hamiltonian for the ions? It's the kinetic energy of the ions plus the full born oppenheimer potential. Okay? This defines a density matrix, which is basically the exponent. Beta is the inverse temperature, 1 over kVT. And this is the partition function, which is the trace of this, precisely. Okay? And then the, the, the exact free energy will be uh, this one, right? The quantum statistical average of the energy plus the Hamiltonian and the entropy term, right? The thing is that, as Francesco said, this born oppenheimer potential is a many-body object. Not, it's not a two-body object. It's a many-body, very complex object. So we have no idea of what this is, right? We, we don't know. So in path integral molecular dynamics, what they try is to somehow map this object somehow and do the calculations with that somehow, right? But this is a many-body complex object. So what we, what we do is the, the following. We, we propose a variational problem. So we take a density matrix trial with the tilde, okay, that it's uh, defined by a trial Hamiltonian, which is just formed by kinetic energy and a trial potential, okay? 
This defines a density matrix, and we substitute the true density matrix by the, our trial density matrix. Okay? So you see the substitution is the, the blue from the red. But what it is not changed is the potential, right? This is what I meant before. The potential is the full part of a Hammer potential, right? So then we have the variational principle. This free energy, right, is higher or equal to the true free energy. Obviously, the quality holds when this Hamiltonian, this potential, trial potential, is this one. Then we have the quality. If not, this free energy is going to be larger, right? So this, the idea is, okay, let's obtain, minimize this free energy with all the parameters we have here, in this potential, and then we'll have a very good approximation of the free energy of the system, considering the full and harmonic potential, right? This is the idea. So we call it cell consistent harmonic because our trial potential is harmonic in shape, right? So as I said, it's parameterized by centroid positions, right, and auxiliary force constant, right? Again, to be clear, this is different, these are different from the harmonic potential that we use and Francesco presented. What is the difference? The, here, the, these centroid positions are not necessarily the positions that minimize the Bornopeheimer position. They could be, they may not be. Okay? Are different. For us, are trial parameters that we will use as a minimiz minimization uh, variable. And then this force constant that here are very well defined, which are the second derivative of the born oppenheimer potential calculated at the positions that minimize the, the, the born oppenheimer potential, right? Here to us, these are auxiliary and could take in principle any value, right? So we need to optimize them, right? But these two the, uh, variables, let's say the, the central positions and the force constant completely parameterize. Yeah, tell me. So even uh, our stylographic error a is the same as R0A, these values can be different. So even if the minimum energy, uh, the distance of the minimum value is the same as, as the R stylographic, we can obtain different values because of the free function. Uh, so it can happen that the, the let's say the, the, the centroid positions and the, mini, the, the positions that minimize the Bornoppelheimer positions are the same. This can happen. This can happen. And these two, the, these auxiliary force constant and this, will only be the same if your born of potential is harmonic. If not, they will be different. But even if they are different, it can happen, actually, that these two, the calligraphic, uh, let's say, the century positions and these, are the same. This can happen. Even if these are different. And the values? These two, uh, you mean? No, the, the B one. These two, yes, will be different. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, basically, therefore, we parameterize the free energy with this set of parameters, centroid positions, and auxiliary force constants. Okay? And then uh, uh, we need to minimize it, right? So, uh, I didn't present this equation, but it's very easy to show that this free energy, the, 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 let's say the shaft free energy, it's given by, this, uh, by, by these two terms. So this would be the free energy of our harmonic trial Hamiltonian, let's say, with this one, which is analytic, we know. I mean, I didn't put the question, but you can go to Ashcroft book, for example, of any solid state book, and there is a free energy. This is well defined in terms of the, uh, it's well defined. And then we have the, the difference between the true potential and our trial Hamiltonian, okay? The quantum statistical average. So this is the, the true free energy. So it, can, it is analytic. So one example of the shaft, okay? So we have this uh, 1D uh, potential, right? This is the born oppenheimer potential. What is the harmonic solution? It's the minimum, right? But this is the born oppenheimer energy, but the energy of the system, of the ions, is this one. What is this difference? I, I'm asking. So this is the energy of the, of the system. What is, and this is not the born oppenheimer energy. What is this difference? Is that true that this was the lifetime of the energy? No. This difference is one half h bar of omega in the harmonic approximation, right? So this is the zero point energy is considered, right? So we have calculated here the second derivative of the potential, right? This defines a, a, a zero point energy, which is one half h bar of omega, that omega that we get from the second derivative here. We add to the, this value and we have this energy. If we solve the system exactly, we have this energy, 
which is much lower. Right? Because here we can solve uh, numerically this exactly. We, if we solve with the shell, we have this energy, this red stuff. Okay? It's very, very close. Very close to the exact energy. It's Obviously, it's higher. It's a variational method. We cannot get lower. It has to be higher. Right? So we, we see it, we are very close. But not only. So here, also in the, in the, in the white figure, so here you have the wave function, the unique wave function, or I think the square of the wave function. This is the harmonic, which is a Gaussian. The uh, harmonic uh, uh, wave function is a Gaussian. It's centered at the midpoint of the born of the position. Our Sha is centered at a different place, basically at this point here. Okay? It's still a Gaussian. This is the harmonic, cell cosine harmonic approximation. It's a Gaussian. But the interesting thing is that the expectation value of the position operator with the true uh, exact uh, wave function gives us a value which is very, very close to our centroid position. So somehow we can also get a very good renormalization of the uh, centroid positions with this uh, theory, right? In a system where the, the anachromosity is extreme. Even if the wave function, the, the Gaussian the one that we have, and the true wave function are not so similar. But the centroid position comes out very well. So let's say the expectation value of the position operator comes out very well, also in this theory. Okay. So how we do these things? Okay. Let me. I want. I think it's important to speak about. Tell me. Yeah. So. Um, so okay. So the essence is the sharp uh, mechanism is that Uh, it, it, it might, it, it might. I'm not saying, so this is the approximation we are doing in the end. So yeah. somehow uh, our approximation is this one, this difference, right? Somehow. What we are claiming with this slide is that precisely, uh, even in, if this is different, so if you do neutron scattering or uh, X-ray scattering, you see where the atoms are, the outcome is this, right? This is the outcome, right? That you see experimentally. This is rather close to the centroid. So this is the point. It's true that there are some situations in which this kind of approximation, this Gaussian approximation, might fail and might break down. So if you have like a tunneling and your ionic wave function has a different minima, uh, in maybe in these kind of ranges, we might have problems. That's true. But even uh, in this kind of rather extreme case, you can see that the difference is quite obvious. We have a, a solution which is good. So if you do experiments here and you measure the, where the positions are, here, we, we, we will be ki kind of OK, even if this difference is very large. Yeah, this is the point. So I think it's good to look at the, uh, our probability distribution function, defined by our trial density matrix, OK, which is this, OK? This is a Gaussian, a product of Gaussians, OK? So you can see. And here we have this uh, matrix, OK? That uh, we're going to find it uh, psi of whatever this is, minus 1, OK? That it's defined by uh, the masses, the polarization vectors, and these A, which are, we call it normal length, OK? That are determined by the temperature, basically the Bose Einstein occupation factor, and the phonon frequencies, OK? At equal zero, this probability distribution function is the square of the wave, uh, ionic wave function. I say. Is the square. So it's the probability distribution function defined by the by the wave function. Okay. So just that. It's also it's also a Gaussian, right? The solution of the harmonic ground state is a Gaussian. This at any other temperature is just a Gaussian. What changes is the let, let, let's say this term through this Bose Einstein occupation factor. That's what changes. Okay. So uh, as I said here, uh, these uh, polarization vectors and frequencies are not the harmonic ones are those that diagonalize the, our auxiliary force constant. Okay, right. So we have an analogous uh, diagonalization equation to our uh, with our auxiliary force constant. They define some auxiliary phonon frequency. Okay, but in principle, what they do and these polarization vectors and these frequencies they just determine this term here in the Gaussian. That's all for the moment. Okay. That's all, OK? In principle, these are auxiliary phonons, if you want, phonon frequencies, that help us in this minimization process, right? 
So um, this is what I was saying here. Okay, they are just they, get, they just define the probability distribution function. That's all for the moment. Okay, this is a nice exercise if you want to do analytically the things, right? So you can prove that actually the expectation value of the position operator taken with this uh, 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 density matrix are the centroid positions. This is a nice exercise if you like math. Okay, so that would show that you you, you understand the things. If you go to the normal mode basics, this transformation was uh, presented by, by Francesco. So the, the probability distribution function in the normal mode basis is just a product of Gaussian. Here you can see really clearly, and actually the, the, the width is really related to this normal length that I defined before, right? So this can show you that this is our probability distribution function for what, just one mode. That for example, for fixed T, okay, if we increase the frequency, this sharpens, okay? So let's say higher quantum frequencies mean uh, uh, a more peaked uh, Gaussian distribution function. Let's say, right? So the atoms will displace less. If the phonons are very soft, the probability distribution function will be wider, right? And for fixed frequency, if we uh, increase the temperature, also this will drop, right? Okay. So somehow this is our probability distribution function. Okay, so higher frequencies mean narrower distribution function. Okay, a higher temperature means wider uh, distribution function. Okay, so when we are talking about taking uh, quantum statistical averages, we are probability distribution function. We are talking about these objects. Basically, this means the trace. This is an operator, O, that just depends on, on positions. Okay, right? For example, the forces or the bohr oppenheimer potential, for example. Okay. So this means that we need to take the integral with respect to the all ionic positions of that operator times our probability distribution function. Okay? This is what we mean by quantum statistical average. An example. Let's take the mean square displacement of an ion, A, okay? From, with respect to the centroid position. Okay? This is squared. You can do the math. You go back to this equation. So this is very easily solved in the normal mode basis, basically applying this transformation. You go to that transformation, you can have this object, and basically you will see that this just gives you this, this thing, right? Okay? So where we have our uh, auxiliary polarization vectors, auxiliary frequencies, and here we have the Bose-Einstein occupation of that frequency, right? So this shows you if, even if the temperature is zero, okay, this term is zero, we have the zero point, the, the atoms move, right? This is a zero point energy. And you can see that the lower the phonon frequencies, the higher is going to be the are going to be the fluctuations, and you can see that the higher the temperature this increases, the higher are going to be the fluctuations. Right? Good. So how we do the minimization of the free energy? Okay. We do a, a gradient descent minimization of the free energy. So we start. Uh, we define a, tra uh, a trajectory in space, defined by these central positions and auxiliary force constant. We start from some starting position, some starting uh, force constant and we go along the trajectory, right? So I, and, and, and then until we find the minimum of this free energy. So at the minimum, at the minimum we have just some auxiliary phonon frequencies and polarization vectors. But as I said, this just defines the uh, probability distribution function, OK? Not the experimental phonon frequencies, OK? Right? So in, so far, these auxiliary uh, uh, phonons are just the, the, the degrees of freedom we have to minimize the free energy, okay? Then, uh, this is physical. In the end of the minimization, the, the final centroid positions that we have are, are the expectation value of the position operator. So this is where we expect uh, experiments to, to detect, to measure the ions by X-ray or whatever, right? And also we have this quantity. This is the free energy, okay? So we have also a good approximation of the free energy, right? So in principle, this is what I mean by this slide is that we have a thermodynamic solution here. We are talking about thermodynamics. We have free energy. That's all we have. And we have another thermodynamic quantity, which are the ionic positions, the, the centroid positions, which are the renormalized ionic positions, taking into account an harmonicity and also quantum effects, right? Because this formalism is well defined at zero Kelvin as well. There is no absolutely no problem with that. We don't care about the temperature. For us, it's a well defined parameter. So if we want to do this minimization, we need the gradient of the free energy, right? We need to calculate the gradient, okay, to do a, a, a steepest descent minimization. 
So the, the, these are the expression of the gradient. It's a bit uh, nasty, OK? So well, this is easy to understand. This is the gradient of the free energy with respect to a centroid position. It's basically, because this, actually this term here is 0. OK, this, the quantum statistical average of this term is 0. OK, but we add it for numerical reasons. OK? But if you want, I could have put here the bracket. So basically, the, the, the derivative of the free energy with respect to the centroid position is the quantum statistical averages of the force, of the born oppenheimer forces. OK, this F here are the born oppenheimer forces. Those that you calculate with VASP, with quantum express, or whatever. For a given structure, it gives you forces that are coming from the Born-Oppenheimer uh, energy surface, right? So the true force, if you want, okay, is the quantum statistical average of that force, taken with our probability distribution function. Okay? I don't know if you understand this analogy. So it's the true force is the quantum statistical average of the forces you calculate with, uh, with, with wh whichever code that you have or any empirical potential code that you use or whatever, right? The forces that come from the bottom behind the The gradient with respect to the um, um, force constants, okay, this is a bit more complicated. Uh, here we have a tensor that uh, it's given here, where uh, basically uh, we have polarization vectors and auxiliary phonon frequencies that enter here. It's a complicated object, but and the temperature also affects here. So you see, you have the Bose Einstein occupation factor. Here we have masses. And we have the quantum statistical average of the difference between the true force minus the force, this F with V tilde, are the forces that would be defined by our, by our trial harmonic uh, force constant, auxiliary force constant, which are basically these. Right? And then here we have the difference between the displacement, which with a given rotation with that matrix that I introduced in some few slides before. Okay. So basically here, to calculate this gradient, we need to calculate averages of forces. And here, we need to calculate uh, average of forces times displacements, somehow. OK? So uh, therefore, we, once we have the gradients, we can start doing the minimization. right? And one thing that I need to say is that we always, in the SHA, use symmetries. Well, you can choose not to use symmetries, but we use symmetries. And at each step in this minimization trajectory, we symmetrize these gradients with the symmetries of the crystal, right? And therefore, this is very advantageous for us. So the, the, the minimization is much simpler and, and converges much faster if we have more symmetries, OK? So symmetries are good, are helping you, OK? So we use a preconditioned gradient descent. So the idea is the following. Imagine you have this potential, OK? Uh, uh, and you want to find the minimum. And you start from here. So the typical uh, gradient descent approach would be the following. So you calculate here the derivative. Right? OK? And then you do a step, OK, in this way. So with lambda, given a step. OK? And this is the gradient. So if the gradient is, let's say, uh, negative, so with this, we go up. So we will come here. Right? Then you calculate again here the gradient again, and you move, and so on and so forth. Right? This has a problem, right? Because Im imagine if your lambda step is too large, it can happen that you come from here, there, and you go out, even if you follow that. So somehow this step is important. Right? A trick is to do a preconditioned gradient descent. And this is what we do in the sharp. Okay? So instead of uh, calculating the step in that way, we here divide by the second derivative of the, of the free energy calculated at that position. Right? So if the system is purely, the potential is purely harmonic, which is obviously not the case, but if it's harmonic, right? so you can see that when we plot this uh, second derivative here, it's 2b. Right? So we have 2b divided by 2b. We remove this. And if lambda is equal to 1, OK, in one step, we find the solution. We find the, the next one will be the minimum, right? So therefore, and now this lambda becomes a dimensional, OK? So this is the step that we do in, the, in this gradient descent. So therefore, the message is that in a purely harmonic crystal with lambda equal to 1, OK, this has no unit. If you use this preconditioning, this, let's say, second derivative divided, you find the solution in one step, OK? Obviously, this is not going to be the case in our uh, so, uh, case because it's not a harmonic potential. But maybe this is a good idea to do this kind of precondition. This is what I mean, right? And this is what we do. So basically, we calculate this trajectory on the force constant and the central positions considering this uh, precondition uh, gradient. 
And actually, the equations become much simpler. Okay, so basically, here all these tensor lambda tensor that I introduced before disappears, and it's simpler, right? And uh, basically, we just need to calculate that object, and this is how we do, right? So a uh, one one remark here. So um, so we can just also minimize the SHA fixing the centroid positions. Imagine that I forget. Okay, I, I just want to forget about the uh, renormalization of the of the of the positions due to the quantum and harmonic effects. So I just fix the centroids. Okay, I, I just see which is the effect of uh, unharmonicity in the uh, auxiliary uh, force constant. Right. So then if you do that, if you go back to the equations, you can prove that actually you have this self-consistent equation. So let's say the quantum statistical average of the second derivatives of the potential, right, taking with our uh, density matrix, right, that de depends on our auxiliary force constant, need to be the auxiliary force constant. Obviously, this, this defines a self-consistent equation because these two have to be the same, right? So therefore, here you can define a loop, a self consistent loop here, right? So you start with some force constant. You calculate this quantum statistical average, okay? You obtain some auxiliary force constant. You create a new density matrix. You calculate again this derivative, and so on and so forth, and, until you find self-consistency, and that can be a solution of the shy. It's equivalent to what we said, right? This opens an, uh, another way of implementing the shy. Okay, that we are not really following. We do the gradient descent minimization, but this is something, this equation, I mean, can be used for some implementations of the SHA as well. Actually, some people right now in the, what, uh, maybe uh, Lorenz will speak a bit about that on Thursday, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, when you, they do TDEP, it's another method that I said. Basically, they are using this self-consistency equation. So basically, if they are doing that, they, and they fall self consistency, this is equivalent to the SHA, somehow. Okay, okay anyway. The story is, if we want to do this gradient descent minimization, we need to calculate the, the energy, this quantum statistical average, the quantum statistical average of the forces, and the forces times the displacement, okay? So how we do that? If you see all these operators that we have here are just operators of the positions of the ions, right? So basically, we, have, we need to do this kind of integrals, right? So what we do here is a, a Monte Carlo-like integral. So basically, we create ionic configurations in a supercell, right? According to the initial uh, density matrix that defines our zero value, right? So this defines, uh, we have a probability distribution function, which is a Gaussian, so we create some configurations according to that distribution, boom, a set of them, right? Let's say Ri, that goes from one to the number of configurations that you have created. And then what we do is basically approximate this integral, right? With just the sum, we calculate the for these configurations that we have created with this distribution function, we calculate this operator here for those configurations with EFT or whatever you want, and we do this average. Right? This is a, a standard Monte Carlo uh, integral. Okay? So what do we need to calculate? We need to calculate in these configurations, we need to calculate forces, and that's it, and the energies. So which are, in any DFT code, this is a standard. So you basically, for a given configuration, the, the, the born oppenheimer energy is the one, the energy that you get as an output, and the forces you get them as an output. Okay? So we always do this externally, let's say. Okay? So exactly, that's what I meant. So we need to evaluate in supercells the forces and the uh, energies. That's all we need to do, okay? So then here there is something that is important, okay? So in principle, we have a starting uh, auxiliary force constant and auxiliary central positions, right? These define uh, a density matrix, let's say, right? A probability distribution function, this one, right? But then what happens? We create these configurations, we calculate the forces for them, we can calculate the gradients for them, and we can do a minimization step, okay? We have done a minimization step. What happens in, after the minimization step? The centroids are new. We have new positions, and we have new auxiliary force constants. They are different. So are we supposed to generate, again, with this new density matrix, let's say, new, new centroid, new auxiliary force constant, another set of configurations, calculate the forces for them and the energies for them, and then do another step? 
if that was this, if that was true, this this will be horrible because we would need to at every single step in the conjugate gradient trajectory, we need we would need to calculate forces, ab initio, for example. So this is this would be a very bad idea. We can do better, right? What's the idea that we use uh, some reweighting technique? Okay. So at a given step n in the conjugate gradient, uh, conjugate gradient in the, in the in the gradient descent step, okay, this is the integrals, the type of integrals we want to calculate, right? In principle, analytically, we can here just divide the starting distribution function and multiply the starting distribution function, okay? This is this is exact, okay? And how do we approximate this? Okay, we approximate this simply by this uh, integration, calc. Uh, including this ratio here in the evaluation of the integral. So basically, this is like calculating, uh, let's say, assuming that the positions or the configurations that you created could have still uh, be uh, described by the distribution function that we have at step n on the conjugate gradient minimization. So we don't need to recalculate again, let's say, the forces and the and the, uh, the forces and the energies for these at every single step in the minimization. I don't know if this is clear or not, okay? In principle, if the, if the sampling was infinite, this, this would be okay, okay? But we don't have an infinite sampling of configurations, so therefore, this is not uh, exact, so this is an approximation. When this is valid, this is valid when, let's say, uh, if we remove this, let's say, if we put here the operator equal to one, this has to be equal to one. Because the integral of the, uh, of the, let's say, if I remove this, okay, this integral is normalized to one, okay? So if this integral is, uh, let's say, this integral is equal to one, or is close to one, I'm okay with that, okay? The reweighting scheme that we have here is good, is valid, okay? But if this gets this integral different from one, basically, we are doing something very wrong, okay? So somehow this, this tells us when uh, we are doing good with the reweighting and when we are doing bad with the reweighting, right? I think I have another uh, slide for that. Okay, yeah, here, another remark. Basically is that uh, we can apply the SHA at any degree of theory for the electrons, for the Born-Oppenheimer, right? Because here we just need to calculate forces and energies, Born-Oppenheimer energies and Born-Oppenheimer forces. So we can use empirical potentials, machine learning potentials, we can use DFT ab initio, we can go beyond DFT with Monte Carlo forces, GW, whatever you want, basically. Obviously, this will determine the, the, the cost of, the, of your calculation. So this is a bit of the story that I was talking about, about getting out of the statistical range. So imagine that we have, this is our initial Gaussian distribution, okay? And we have created configurations according to uh, this, uh, this distribution function, right? And this is the histogram, let's say, an histogram that we have created, of the configurations created. Okay, you see. So what can happen? That eventually you are doing the minimization, right? And your, your centroids are changing. So let's say that the center of the position is shifting, let's say down. And also the, the, the width is changing. So the, the, the auxiliary phonons are changing, right? And eventually you end up in this situation. Obviously, right now you are trying to describe the physics with these configurations created. You are trying to map this uh, distribution function. And obviously this is not a good idea. Right? So then here you have a problem, right? So we cannot continue here with that. So how we um, uh, detect when we are having a problem here? We do that with this kind of uh, Kong Liu criteria, okay? That basically tells us how many configurations from our ens ensemble that we created are still able to de describe the, the system somehow, okay? So this is a ratio, uh, basically. So when, uh, which is described by this, okay, this equation, is, this is the equation. So what our criteria normally is that when this, the ratio between the number of effective uh, uh, configurations according to this criteria, uh, divided by the total number of configurations that we created is uh, smaller than a given number, we stop, okay? And, and, and the, the minimization, we stop it, and what we do next? So the code will tell you, you are, uh, your statistics are bad, let's say, something like that. So you, I, I will stop because I, I'm out of the statistical criteria, okay? Some, somehow the reweighting scheme that we, ha we are using is not valid any longer, okay? So we need to start again. So we stop, we have some final 
centroid positions, fi some final auxiliary force constant, then what do we need to do? Then we, yes, at that moment, we need to generate new configurations and, and do continue, right, somehow, right? This is the idea. Normally, this number is around 0 0.5, but it's true that sometimes you can be a bit more easy going with that uh, value, sometimes you need to be a bit more stringent. That's a bit uh, of experience that, uh, that one, one can play a bit with, with these numbers, right? But uh, normally around 0 0.5 is like a good idea. But maybe in the very beginning, if you are very far from the solution, maybe you can be a bit more relaxed. You can, but you can go a bit longer in the minimization and then, uh, uh, then you, you can be a bit more exigent with that, okay? Sure. In this picture? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is completely random. Yeah, this picture. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, I'm not exactly sure, but uh, maybe Lorenzo can reply better. So when you are at 0 0.5, what does this mean exactly? That they are very close and half of them enter inside the Gaussian? I, I don't know exactly what it means exactly. I don't know. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's uh, that's a uh, that's a great question, right? So actually, uh, in principle, you have no idea. So because you don't know how far your solution is from your starting point, right? So one thing that you we normally do, we start from the harmonic solution. So we start from the harmonic solution. This is our starting point. But eventually, imagine you have done a, a minimization at a given temperature, right? You have found the solution at that temperature. Then you want to increase the temperature and you need to do another minimization. So a good starting point would be the, the minimization of the previous temperature, for example. So yeah, you never know. Obviously, the closer you are from the solution, the faster you're going to uh, find the solution, right? So our rule of thumb is that start from the harmonic solution or if you have already a, a calculation at a given temperature, use that solution for another temperature. That's normally what we do. So don't restart from the harmonic solution in, in, uh, if you have already done a simulation for a given temperature, for example. Yeah. Have you ever encountered problems with pulsing or Yeah, so pulsing, when you use something one can worry about. Yeah, so so far we have not, in principle, no. Yeah, this is a good question, yeah, but uh, so far not. Maybe, let's say, the free energy landscape, it's uh, somehow more uh, well-defined, uh, so it's not so, you don't have so many local minima in, in that sense. No, we, principle, no. So what you can do is to, to start from different uh, starting points and see that uh, you are reaching the same value, in principle. Uh, number of configurations. So this is a good question. So uh, this is a so you want to spend the less, right? So somehow I I, I have some slide later. I, I will I will tell you later. Okay. Lorenzo, you want to make a comment or? So the part of local minima, you can have uh, different. Uh, so exactly like you have local minima in the bottom of an alleged glass, and at last if you can have different phases actually, which are not the global minimum of the free energy, which right. may remain stuck. What is very difficult and we never found is that uh, you have the same phase and two local minimum of the free energy landscape, for example, of the auxiliary form. Right. This we never observed. But you may have, of course, different phases which are local minima. Yeah, right, right, that's a good point, yeah. Okay, so then when do we stop the minimization? Imagine we are okay with the, with the stochastic criteria, we are okay. So indeed we should stop when the gradient is zero, with both the gradient with respect to the centroids and the force constant is zero. Effectively, uh, you never reach zero. So how do we determine that? So we compare 
the gradient, let's say the, uh, the, the modulus of the gradient, with the modulus of the error. Well, it's not the exact error, but it's an estimate of the error, a stochastic error. Okay? So when this is smaller than, uh, than this, with a prefactor here, with, for both okay, uh, gradients, we decide that the, the, the minimization is converged. Okay? Normally, we are rather, uh, we let this error to be big because sometimes you might have an error on one kind of configuration. So don't take the error too seriously. This is the message. So that's why this delta normally is very small. We, take, we, we put very small values and we really try to go to zero, zero gradients. But imagine if you start, you go to the zero gradient, you restart from that point, another simulation, you might not find the same solution. Why? Because we have a stochastic error, right? So our solution is a stochastic. So we have a statistical error, right? Okay. So just an example here. Okay. So this is a, a model calculation. This is not uh, true, not physical, but I have started uh, a shell simulation for this structure of T in Telluride, which is distorted. So you can see that this bond here is 3.31 Armstrong, and this one is 3.24. And after the shell relaxation, I obtain this uh, high symmetry structure. With, uh, where the bonds now are 325 and 328, 328. So somehow the structure has changed and has symmetrized in the shaft. So basically, this is a model calculation. So this is what you will see in the output of the calculation. I mean, you will, have, you will make an example in the afternoon, uh, another system. But this is the free energy along the SHA minimization trajectory. So it starts from these values and it goes down, 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 down a lot. Okay. Here you see uh, the Kong Liu ratio, okay? So we have 100 configurations, I started with 100. So you see that we started with 100 and this ratio went to 50, okay? And uh, I said, okay, I put this criteria of 0 0.5. So let's say here, I, the code told me, oh, stop, regenerate new configurations with, uh, with this uh, uh, force constants and centric positions that you have at that, at that point and, and continue the minimization, right? So this happened one, uh, I needed to do it one, two, three, four, five times more than the starting one. And then in the end, you see that in the end, I went to, let's say, uh, zero gradient of the force constant and the, the one with respect to the centroids, the structure gradient, we call it. You see here the evolution of the auxiliary form of frequency. So uh, this was my starting guess. And you see that in the end, they, they really went and they plateaued, okay, at a given point in the minimization. So this is a good sign. So when the gradients are very small, basically, the, 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 the auxiliary frequencies do not change anymore. And therefore, you are somehow converged, right? This is basically the convergence criteria. Somehow. So what you can do is, let's say here, and answering to your question, so here I use 100 configuration, right? So what you want is, in principle, in the beginning, Imagine that these are DFT calculations. So at each step here, I need to do 100 configurations, 100 DFT calculations that you can do in all at the same time. You have a big computer, you can do them all at the same time. Right? This is not like molecular dynamics, you need to go step by step. No, here you can do them all at the same time. Right? So here you do 100, 100, 100, 100, 100. Right? So basically, when you are still far from the minimum, right, from the solution, you don't need many configurations. So I, probably I could have done this with much less. Right? I could have approached the minimum with less configurations. And once you feel that you are close to the minimum, and what this means, that the frequencies are plateauing, right? and you want to a uh, more precise calculation, then at this moment, you can do a final uh, calculation with more configurations. And this is what I did, for example, here. So I increased to uh, 1,000 here, for example. I redid the minimization. You see that the free energy barely changed. The gradient barely changed. So basically, and the phonons basically didn't change much. Okay, so even here, I know this solution is more precise, but the result that I obtained previously was already very good, right? So the, the auxiliary phonon frequencies are well good. Obviously, this is very system dependent. The number of configurations is very system dependent. So more symmetries, less configurations. This is important, right? So somehow effectively having symmetries is a way of including more configurations. So you have a, symmetry, a system with very few symmetries, uh, it will be tougher. So you will probably need more configurations to, to, to reach the minimum. So this is a bit the, the idea. So this is very system dependent. So you have lots of symmetries that you will probably need less configurations to, to reach the minimum. So yeah, so let's see some uh, examples. So this example was uh, presented by, by Francesco. 
already. So this is palladium hydride at zero GPA. So these are the uh, harmonic phonons that Francesco already introduced. And this is the solution, the, the experimental point that on, on, only we have it at, at gamma here. And these are the auxiliary phonons, OK? OK, these are the auxiliary phonons, right? Those that I introduced here. Actually, they are not very far from the experiment, right? So even if they are auxiliary, it's true that even if they have no physical meaning, and this physical meaning will be evident in lectures three and mostly four, given by Raffaello, uh, they are still uh, something that is much closer probably to the reality than the harmonic solution, OK? So it includes unharmonic renormalization, right? And in these papers, like the old initial papers, we were assuming them to be physical somehow, okay? to have a physical meaning. But I don't want to confuse you. So far, this is, these are just artifacts that we use for uh, minimizing our free energy. Right? It will like, become evident later. Okay? But the story is that we can do free energy. So we imagine that this is, this is the, the thermal expansion okay, calculated for this system. In the harmonic approximation, we cannot do the calculation of the thermal expansion because the harmonic solution has instabilities. So ba basically, if you calculate the free energy in the quasi-harmonic approximation, which is basically summing one half h bar of omega, right, with the bose einstein occupation, right, you cannot do that because you have imaginary form of frequencies. So you cannot use the quasi-harmonic approximation here to calculate the thermal expansion, for example, right? But with the shaft free energy that we obtain, we can really do that. And actually, we can, these are the, the results we obtain, and I'm in rather good agreement with the, with the experiments. So you can do thermodynamics, that, that's the point. You can do thermodynamics in systems that are strongly uh, unharmonic, like, like this one. Okay? So one thing that we can do more, that it's going beyond, that I didn't talk about yet, okay, is that, I mean, you are very used to use, uh, probably many of you have, uh, have used uh, DFT codes. Quantum espresso, VAS, blah, 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 or into K, or whatever. So if you want to do a calculation and you want to determine the lattice parameters, right, you do a variable cell relaxation. I don't know how you call it. Each code call, uh, calls it in a different way. But you are basically changing the, the A, B, C, alpha, beta, gamma uh, vectors, changing the volume to uh, relax the structure with a given target pressure, for example, right? So how this is done by the ab initio codes, they, what they are calculating is this uh, pressure, okay, this is a tensor, okay, where we have derivatives of the born behavior potential taking with the deformations of the lattice. This is the tensor, the strain, ten, no, strain tensor, no, strain is called, yeah, the deformations the, the of the changes of the lattice, basically, that is parameters, right? So this is the, this derivative is calculated. Obviously, this is temperature independent, right? Because the born behavior potential does not depend on temperature. Okay. This is a, uh, that's why the harmonic solution does not depend on temperature, as Francesco said. Okay. So this has no uh, temperature dependence, and also it does not consider the fact that in the energy also the ionic fluctuations contribute. Right. The zero point energy. Right. So what we can do instead, we can calculate the, the, this pressure tensor. Okay not as derivatives of the born behavior potential, but as derivatives of our free energy. We have an, there is an analytical equation, so which basically we need to take, uh, calculate the stress tensor coming from the born behavior energy for, uh, and calculate the quantum statistical average of this object, basically average out this result, plus this extra term, okay, which we, where we have displacements and forces, uh, displacement times forces, okay? So we can do that, okay? And this is now, this pressure tensor is temperature dependent because the free energy depends on temperature. And it also includes all the effects of fluctuations, ionic fluctuations in the free energy and in the calculation of the pressure because the pressure, if you calculate the pressure, the, the zero point energy has a contribution on the pressure as well, okay? So, uh, so we can therefore, we can do a relaxation of the lattice, okay, considering these effects, like a VC relax that you do in quantum espresso, or I don't know how it is called in VASP, these kind of uh, cell relaxations that you do in any other code, we can do that also in the shaft, but in this quantum and harmonic regime, okay, including the zero point energy. So how we do that? So basically we need to 
uh, update the lattice parameters in this way, where here we have this, uh, uh, this uh, strain tensor. We, this is our target pressure, let's say, P star. Okay? This is our uh, pressure tens uh, tensor calculated in this way. Right? So, and here we have a step okay, that uh, gives us how much we move from simulation to simulation, from, from population to population when we regenerate the configurations, the lattice parameter. Okay. Uh, this lambda uh, is the step which is the best to calculate it in this way where this is omega, omega is the, is a, when we have the bulk modulus as a, a parameter. Okay. So it's better to, have, to know the bulk modulus beforehand that maybe the classical bulk modulus is a good approximation already to, the, to do that. So without the standard bulk modulus that is calculated normally. So you can have a good approximation of the step. Okay. So in that way, the, the SHA will also relax the lattice parameters and the side. And precisely this is what, okay, now I show you the flow chart of the full SHA calculation. I mean, it's a bit of a mess, but uh, basically, so we have some starting force constant and state relative positions and also lattice vectors, okay? So the story is we generate a random ensemble, these configurations in a super show that I was mentioning. Then you compute energies, forces, and stress tensors for these configurations that you create. Okay? You can do that at any theory level you want. You can do it at initio, you can do it with a machine learning potential, you can do it with an empirical potential, you can do whatever you want. Right? If we are using a initio code, this is the expensive part. Okay? This is the, the most expensive part, is this one. Right? Because we need to go to a normally we do these calculations in a cluster. You need to do it with your code, whatever code you want, okay? And then bring them back to the SHA, okay? To perform the minimization, let's say, okay? This is a big idea. So somehow, right now, you will see this afternoon, this is already very well integrated with the ASE package. So it's quite automatic to, to do these things and call the, the, the codes, also to call to clusters. These things you will learn this afternoon, these things, how we do that, right? But then the story is, okay, forget about this. So we do the preconditioning algorithm. We uh, calculate the gradients. We update, uh, update uh, the, the, let's say, the, the, the central positions and the force constant. So we ask ourselves, uh, is still, uh, uh, we are still in a good uh, uh, stochastical regime, okay? If we are still statistically okay, we ask ourselves, did we find the minimum, right? So then, no, so we still go along. So we do many loops here, okay? And how this can exit from this loop? At a given moment, imagine we are out of a statistical regime. So then we ask ourselves, do you want to relax the lattice? Let's say lattice vectors. If no, you don't want to change the, the lattice. So you generate here new random ensemble, okay? That will come from the, let's say, the for, uh, force, auxiliary force constant and central position that you have at that step, right? If you want to relax the lattice, you will update the lattice as well, according to that uh, last algorithm that I told you, and you will generate new random uh, configurations, and you will go along. So if, if again, the, the, it exits the, this loop with uh, the fact that you are statistically out of range, you will again regenerate new configurations. At a given moment, you will find a new one, right? So, uh, if you want to uh, find the minimum, also again, we'll check, do you want to relax the lattice, right? If you want to relax the lattice, you'll see, okay, I'm okay with the threshold or not. So let's say that I, I, I have the target pressure that I wanted, yes or no. If, if the answer is no, you will update the lattice and you will enter again in this loop, right? If you are okay with the lattice you found, then you are converged and you will exit the loop, right? So I think this is the, the general idea of the of the of the SHA flowchart calculation, right? So this is the example that Francesco said. It's a very clear example of, of this change of the cell as well, okay? So this is Lantanum H10, one of the structures that Francesco presented. It's a rhomboclitoral one. This has a much lower Born-Oppenheimer energy than the full FM minus 3M high symmetry that Francesco presented, right? So this is some different population steps in the SHA minimization. So the rhombohedral structure, in the beginning we had, it had an angle of 62.5 degrees. And as we went in this minimization in the SHA, it was going down, 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 down to 60 degrees. 
And with 60 degrees, you can describe an FCC lattice. It's, you can describe it in, a, in the primitive cell, basically it's a rhombohedral uh, lattice with 60 degrees, right? So it, it blocked there, right? And these are somehow the bike of uh, position, okay? So in the beginning, we had these bike of positions. These were changing. Uh, so in this structure, you have four different parameters that determine all the bike of positions of this structure. So they were changing. So from here, you will go into 0 0.25, okay? And these three different values merged in one single value, okay? And now this, this value belongs to the bike of positions of the fm minus 3m, and this 0 0.25 also belongs to the fm minus 3m. So we were seeing very clearly how the structure was changing in this sham minimization and to create this uh, structure that is stable only thanks to uh, quantum anharmonic effects. Okay? So this is all, all I wanted to say. So some of the, the, the take-home messages are that the Shai separational method based on the thermodynamic free energy. So we have thermodynamics here. We are doing thermodynamics so far. Okay? We can deal with a strong anharmonicity in the non-perturbative regime. Okay? I think this is clear. Perturbative theory is not uh, valid here. Okay? We can relax the structures, okay? both internal positions and also the cell parameters, okay? taking into account this quantum and harmonic landscape. Okay? So, so this is important. So the, the, the auxiliary frequencies that I have spoken so far, okay, those that come out as an output of the minimization, are related to the width of the ionic wave function or the probability distribution function at t different from zero, right? And in principle are not physically relevant quantities, okay? So this is a message that I think is important that it's clear, okay? And uh, something important, I, I, one of the properties that I also said in the perturbative uh, case, and Francesco said, is that phonons have a lifetime, uh, a line width, if you want, in the spectral functions. I didn't say anything at all about that, okay? So let's say the lifetime of phonons and the line width of phonons is something, a, a very intrinsic and harmonic property, and I said nothing about it so far, okay? So, so far here, I'm just doing a variational minimization. So somehow I'm just, for the moment, talking about uh, thermodynamics, okay? So all these points will be clearer tomorrow, okay? I think, uh, Rafael, you're talking tomorrow, right? So Rafael will give lectures three and four, which where all these things, I think, will become clearer. And what's the relation of the physical phonons that you measure experimentally, right? and the line width of the phonons with, within this theory, okay? But so far, at this moment, everything is thermodynamic, okay? So that's all. Thank you for your attention.